Uh, in such meetings, uh, it's always uh, good when you see a talk on winning because it means that usually we come close to the end of the meeting. Uh, however, this may be the most important talk of the meeting because uh, all surviving patients from mechanical ventilation have to pass through this winning process. And second, uh, the winning process is probably the place where you can save the most ventilator time for patients. Um, this idea of liberating the patient, not winning, uh, is not new and was proposed uh, in 1987 by Jesse Wall Larry Wood saying the process of liberating patients from the ventilator begin as soon as the patient is intubated by tailoring settings to the needs of the patient. Uh, this is a nice proposal. However, in the real life, uh, most clinicians think that's what they do, but that's not what they do. Because uh, what we learned in this last 15 years about winning is that one of the major problems with winning has been that we did not identify early enough that patients were in fact ready to be separated from the ventilator. So just letting the winning uh, based on our feeling that the patient is improving is not enough. And probably the study which uh, put this all together after many years of clinical research was this study by Wes Ellie published in 1996. Who is aware of this study in the room? Who has ever heard of this study? Nobody? Good. One. Okay. Um, this study simply said, okay, let's try to describe the uh, simple but systematic process to every day assess whether the patient can be separated from the ventilator. Something simple, which means reproducible in any ICU. And it was a three-step process. And this three-step process is the basis of all winning protocols proposed today or, or guidelines or recommendation. The first one is a daily screening. Every day you go at the bedside and you ask very simple questions. Is oxygenation okay? PAF ratio be uh, above 200? Is the need for PEEP uh, relatively limited? PEEP no more than five? Is the patient still needing vasopressor? Yes or no? Is the patient still needing sedatives? Yes or no? Is the patient able to cough when suctioning is performed? Yes or no? And in addition, uh, they measured the ratio of frequency to tidal volume during a short spontaneous breathing trial. And if the F over VT is below 100, uh, so if you say yes to all these points, then it means that the patient should have a spontaneous breathing trial, which is step two. And in this study, it was a two-hour trial of spontaneous breathing. And step three was if the patient is clinically okay at the end of the two hours, you notify the physician that there is 85% chance of a good outcome if the patient is extubated. So this is the basis, a very simple screening. And to make the screening even simpler, many uh, people in, in, uh, uh, propose to remove this measurement of F over VT, which is uh, the more complicated thing. This could be discussed because uh, it, it has a very good screening um, predictive value, but you can make it even simpler. So is PAO2 okay, is PEEP okay? Did you stop sedation? Did you stop vasopressor? Is the patient able to cough? If yes, he should have a spontaneous breathing trial. The spontaneous breathing trial, the duration has been discussed, but this is the basis of the screening strategy which should be used in most uh, ICU patients. 
If you look at winning and all the uh, literature, it's, it's quite complicated because you see many different things and in this uh, meeting we talked about, uh, for instance, the value of P.1, uh, the problem of fluid overload. But in fact, winning has three different aspects if you accept that the strategy proposed is, is the basis of a winning process. In terms of winning, there are three different group of patients, and they have three very different problems. The first group are patients who succeed at the first attempt. We can call it simple winning. And the surprise of the large studies which have been performed about winning was to show that by far this is a larger group in every ICU. So we all talked about very, very complicated winning, but most patients, the problem is simple winning. Then some patients uh, need more than one spontaneous breathing trial, maybe two, three, four, up to one week, and we could call it the difficult winning patients. And then you have a third group, a small number of patients who require much longer, maybe more than one week, they are tracheostomized, the, the prolonged winning. And the, the, the problems for these three groups are very different. For the first one, the main issue is to be sure that you detect as early as possible that these patients are able to breathe. If in your ICU, 90% of your patients are of the first group, it probably means that you detect these patients much too late. So your goal in your ICU is to have the lowest percentage of the first group. In the group two, you started um, with a spontaneous breathing trial, it did not succeed, then the problem is different. The problem is to understand why it was a failure. Is it weakness, is it fluid overload, is it sepsis, etc. And the third group, that's a very complicated group where it's not only a problem of ventilation, it's a problem of global management and for these patients we may need winning centers for instance. So very different clinical questions, you, we, we all put in the bag called winning but uh, the, the, uh, the um, qu clinical questions are very different. So uh, there have been a number of studies and some studies are now published looking at this free group. For instance, uh, just one of the first study uh, which look at their patients admitted during one year in the ICU, 500 patients, uh, 400 intubated, 260 started winning and these are the distribution between the three groups. 60% are simple winning, first group. 26% difficult winning, second group. And only 14% prolonged winning. And when they looked at the outcome, uh, they showed that uh, for the third group, the prolonged winning, the ICU mortality and the hospital mortality is much longer. A recent study from uh, Esteban based on, on a large database also suggested that it is the third group which has a very different outcome. So having said that, we can now think what are the problems which may cause difficult winning. And what we learned in the last 15 years is that the number one problem is this one, that winning is possible but has not been identified. And this is the issue of the group one. Then you have medical problems which may cause wi prolonged winning and this may, or difficult winning. This may be fluid overload, this may be muscle weakness, muscle weakness which may also participate to problems in the group three patients like uh, also severe underlying lung and cardiac disease. So I will spend some time on the first problem, winning is possible but has not been identified 
And I think there are four main categories. Uh, the first one is because you do not have a systematic intervention in your ICU. The second one because you deliver excessive ventilatory assistance. The third because there may be a lack of personnel. And the fourth is that there is a delayed awakening because of the sedation management. So this is mainly a problem of strategy in your ICU with the first group. This is mainly for the second group, and these two issues are for the third group of, of winning difficulties. Just a few examples to illustrate this problem. Lack of intervention. In fact, this was probably the reason why uh, this study was, was positive. The control group in the study by Wes Eli was ventilated with the SIMV, uh, in intermittent mandatory ventilation. And this is a mode where it's very difficult to know whether the patient is re ready to be separated from the ventilator or not. So if you just rely on the decrease in the mandatory breast during SIMV, you have no intervention, and you don't know when the patient is ready. So that was a major advantage of a systematic intervention. Uh, the, the second issue I mentioned, uh, we already discussed a lot during this meeting, is, is over assistance. And I just took this example of the two first randomized, ra randomized trials on winning, the one we published in 94 and the one published one year later by Esteban in 95. And just I want to focus on the fact that in our study we found that pressure support ventilation was the most efficient way to separate patients from the ventilator. But in the study by Esteban, many results were, were very similar. But the big difference was that in their study, pressure support ventilation was really not uh, as good as the once daily trial of spontaneous breathing, for instance. So why was there this big difference with pressure support ventilation? And the explanation to me is simple. Uh, the, the way pressure support ventilation was used was very different in the two studies. In our study, we decreased pressure support and we did not increase the level until the respiratory rate was at 35 breaths per minute. In Esteban's study, every time the respiratory rate reached 25 breaths per minute, it was considered as respiratory distress and pressure support was increased. So for for the same ventilatory conditions, patients received always more pressure support in the Esteban study and probably had other assistance, which explained the longer time to winning. We also know that a higher pressure support level is associated with more asynchrony, and we know that more asynchrony is associated with longer duration of ventilation. As another proof of evidence in a in a further study, Esteban tested the, the last trial before deciding for extubation, the spontaneous breathing trial, if you wish, TPs versus pressure support of seven. But in this study, the level of respiratory rate threshold was the same. They tolerated 35 breaths per minute for the two arms. And you see that the success at 48 hours was similar for pressure support or TPs. There was even significantly less failure with pressure support, probably slightly easier to tolerate, which has been confirmed in other studies. So it's not only the, the way you, uh, the, the mode you choose, but also the way you, you use it. Uh, there have been also discussion on the optimal duration of TPs trial. In many patients, if you compare 30 minutes or two hours, you see no difference in the success rate and reintubation. So for most of the patients of group one, where there is no reason that winning is complicated, maybe 30 minutes is enough to decide. And the fastest you, 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 you go to decide, uh, the better it will be for the winning success. But for some patients, like in this study, from Jordi Mancebo's group, you see that there was more than one third of patients who failed later on. So maybe for the difficult patients, you can prolong the winning trial, uh, the TPS trial, until two hours. So I mentioned 
no systematic intervention, over assistance, the third problem may be a lack of personnel. You don't have enough personnel to look at your patients. Uh, and this was a study coming from Geneva. Uh, there was a, a survey every year of the duration of mechanical ventilation for COPD patients. And they saw that every year after, year after year, each dot is the mean for one year, there was an increase in the duration of mechanical ventilation. And this seemed to be explained by a decrease in the nurse to patient ratio less and less nurses in the ICU. The year five was terrible. There was a major increase in the duration of mechanical ventilation. So they were convincing enough to have more personnel for the sixth year, and the duration came down. And probably the reason was that they used very long duration of spontaneous breathing trials, so they need a very long monitoring. But this illustrates that uh, you need personnel to hasten the winning process. This is also true for doctors. There have been uh, some debates about whether a protocol, a written protocol describing everything we do is useful. And this is the best study which tested whether a protocol was useful because they had the same approach in the usual care or in the protocol group. But in addition, they had this written protocol. And in this study, they found that there was no influence of a protocol. But they discussed in the paper that they had a high level of physician staffing, which made that every day they had, uh, they make the run uh, for every patient, and for every patient they were discussing about the possibility to win these patients. So if you do that, you don't need a protocol, but you need uh, enough doctors. The fourth problem is delayed awakening because of sedation. And this is before winning, of course. And we now have uh, very strong evidence that we over assist our patients, but we also over sedate our patients very often. This is a very famous study where they decided to do something very stupid, but in fact very pragmatic, which was to come at the bedside every day and to stop sedation, not to decrease sedation, not to reduce. Sedation was supposed to be adapted to Ramsey score, but they said, we see so many patients who do not awake when we stop sedation that we'll try in every patient to stop sedation. And with this, they showed that half of the patient when they stopped sedation did not wake up, so they just wait until they, the patients eliminated the drugs. And you see that the overall effect on duration of mechanical ventilation was uh, that they saved two or three days of mechanical ventilation. So this has been uh, reproduced in a, in a multicenter trial combining the spontaneous awakening trial every day plus a spontaneous breathing trial. They found again that they could reduce the duration of, of ventilation. And in addition, they found that at one year, the survival of patients who had this daily stop of sedation was even better. So we not only delay awakening, but maybe we induce additional problem which uh, have impact on outcome. And some people went further and they said, we should not sedate our patients anymore. This is a protocol of no sedation. It's not exactly no sedation. It's we give bolus of morphine as needed to make the patient quiet, of course to treat pain, and if really needed, we give uh, maybe uh, neuroleptic for agitation, for instance. And in this study, this is a, a, a mono, a, a single center study, there was also a huge effect on the duration of mechanical ventilation. Uh, they just found that they had 
clearly more, patient, more agitated patients and that they needed to use a, a little bit more neuroleptic and they needed also more personnel to take care of the patients. But this is for the good of the patient. So this is a major issue interfering with winning. Let's now switch to difficult winning, which means the first attempt was not a success, so we need to understand why the patient cannot be separated. And then I think a major question is fluid overload and or uh, cardiac dysfunction at the time of winning. You probably know that this was uh, demonstrated many years ago in this beautiful study where these were COPD patients disconnected from the ventilator. And when they were disconnected, they were in respiratory distress with wheezing. So some people say, yeah, it's bronchospasm. No, it's not bronchospasm, it's pulmonary edema. But they needed to insert the pulmonary uh, artery catheter to prove that this respiratory distress, you see here the wedge pressure, was due to a major increase in wedge pressure just at the time you go from controlled ventilation to spontaneous breathing. And you see the one of the explanation, which is the huge swings in, in intrathoracic pressure. Here, you see that after nine minutes, the swings are decreasing. Probably the patient is going to die. And this is probably the only uh, recording we have of a patient who probably has respiratory muscle fatigue. So, of course, the clinician has to reconnect the patient. But this was a major breakthrough saying, hey, many patients who do not tolerate respiration during weaning, it's because of uh, cardiac problems. Um, we tested whether, we and others tested whether the BNP could be used to predict which patients have fluid overload. And in this study with Armand Meconso-Desap, we found that the BNP before any attempt of spontaneous breathing was clearly much higher in the failure. And in addition, for those who were uh, a success at the second or third attempt, there was a decrease in BNP, where, where, whereas those who were still failure at still high BNP level. And there is clear evidence in the literature that the fluid balance at the time you start winning has a major impact on winning outcome. Uh, this is a study from Constantin Matus, and this is a study we already mentioned in patients with ARDS. If you have a, a conservative strategy, which means you try to give less fluid to have a negative uh, fluid balance, you have a longer time, a uh, shorter time uh, on the ventilator. So a lot of evidence that if you reduce fluid overload, you improve winning. For this reason, and this is a study that we just completed, which is not published yet, uh, we tried to see whether a daily measurement of BNP could be useful to drive the winning process. So we made a randomized, uh, multicenter randomized trial where in one group we had daily BNP values. In the other group we also had the values but we did not use it. And when BNP was high, we gave LASIX. Uh, and we stratified the groups on three different kinds of patients. Patients with cardiac history, patients with COPD history, and patients with no cardiac or COPD history. All patients were ventilated with the smart care system, which I described to you, which means that the winning was absolutely the same in both groups. And the end point was the duration of winning. Just to say that it's not so simple to have high BNP and say we give uh, diuretics. We had to draw an algorithm for furosemid based on the response, the individual response of the patients, we had also to take care of potential problems like hypokalemia, uh, alkal um, metabolic alkalosis. Uh, but this algorithm was uh, entirely driven by the nurses. 
the main results are presented here, the winning duration was significantly decreased in the BNP group. The, the duration of ventilation until first extubation was also significantly decreased. There was no other difference in the main outcome. When we look at the three group of patients, car patient with cardiac history, patient with COPD, and the other patients, it was clear that the subgroup of patients with cardiac history was the one who clearly benefited the most from this daily BNP measurement. Respiratory muscle weakness may also impair winning. There are many reasons why patients may be weak. And uh, you know that we now have many patients with this uh, ICU-acquired neuromyopathy, which is often a myopathy, but sometimes a neuromyopathy, which takes longer to recover. And this study, for instance, showed that having this ICU-acquired paresis was a major risk factor for prolonged winning, which, of course, makes sense. So at the time we make this diagnosis, of course, it's difficult to, to react, to do something. We just wait the patient recover. But maybe this can be prevented. And this can be prevented by, let's say, not accepting the fact that our patient should rest in the bed. There is no clinical indication for bed rest uh, for the ICU patient. And there are a number of groups now who try to mobilize the patient as soon as possible. Even the patient still intubated and ventilated, as you see in these three studies with, with three different uh, uh, photographs of patients. You don't go immediately walk, uh, having your patients walking uh, in the corridor. You start some passive mobilizations and active mobilization, then the patient sitting uh, then put in an armchair, and then may, maybe walking. And it seems this strategy also, uh, we, we just have limited data in selected group of patients. This strategy uh, reduce the duration of stay in the ICU and make the patients uh, earlier available for discharge. Then the last group of patients, the last group of patients are those difficult patients who stay for days and days or week in the ICU. Uh, they need tricostomy for sure. Tricostomy is, is useful to decrease work of breathing as we showed many years ago. Uh, please remember that the day you decannulate the patients and remove the tricostomy, you will increase work of breathing. So be sure that your patient is strong enough. Tracheostomy is also useful because you can, uh, it's easier to sit the patient in armchair, it's easier to, you decrease sedation, and here it was shown, for instance, that uh, the oral intake uh, patients uh, having their, their own food uh, could increase only after performing tracheostomy, so it has a number of, of advantages. But we don't have strong data saying it changed outcome uh, but clearly for this subgroup of patients, it's important. For this subgroup, the, the ventilation is not the only thing. There are many general problems, general management. One of them is sleep in the ICU, which is uh, terribly di disrupted in most ICU patients. You see, the, this is the way uh, we describe uh, sleep stage, and this is a, a typical patient just... Uh, uh, arriving in the ICU, for instance, uh, is awake during the day, and then he had the different sleep stage during the night. A typical ICU patient after three weeks is like that. You cannot differentiate day from night. So people say, patient is always sleeping. Yes, it's true, he's always sleeping, but always a very bad sleep. And this is a major issue for patients are myostasis. So the global management of the patients may be different, and that may be an advantage of winning centers where they take care very differently from the ICU to all the environment of the patient. But if the patients stay in the ICU, we 
should all be conscious that these patients are living among us for days and days and weeks and the psychological environment of these patients may be very important. For instance, treating uh, depression, which, which is uh, quite frequent, and maybe being nice with this patient is important. When we have data from patient recollection, they say that their stay in the ICU was a nightmare because they were so anxious to be stuck with the machine. And the few minutes some people, usually the nurses, talk to them, explain the situation, was such a relief for them that I think we have uh, to keep that in mind. Thank you very much.